This is one of the few places in the world I can actually go where people don't immediately comment on my accent. Okay? Because I grew up in Minnesota, right? So usually I give a talk and people go, aren't you from Canada? <laughs> Minnesota. But it's, you know, Minnesota, Canada. It's, it's all the same. I will say coming in from the airport that London, Ontario looks a lot like my hometown. But my hometown is only about 15,000. So it's, uh, maybe there's something weird about more about everything looks the same. Right? So, okay, anyway. Um, today, I, this is a talk which where I pack a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, so I hope to hopefully make your head swim. This is probably too much, but we'll give it a try. But it's, um, it's exciting stuff, and I'm actually pretty excited to be talking about it, which is why I, just, I couldn't bear to get rid of anything from the talk. So we're going to cover a lot of ground here, so bear with me. I hope I, I apologize in advance for not being able to spend as much time on certain things as I'd like. Okay, so I wanted to start off with, though, in this talk, saying a little bit about why the moon is interesting, or why I study the moon. And Something that I think, one of the reasons I run a lunar institute, so I'm not traditionally a lunar person, I do a small body, two year and small rest, is that back when I was born, it was about 1966, I'm just old enough to remember some of the early Apollo landings. And it's, it's hard to realize in a day when you have, you know, we all have you know, 300 channels and the rest, is that you know, there was a time when there were only four TV channels. And I remember as a kid, all of them were covering the moon landings. I remember spending hours and hours watching the astronauts poke around the moon and pick up samples, and do all sorts of exciting things. I thought, boy, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. Fantastic. You know, and that was very, very exciting. And then, since that time, we really haven't done a lot from the human spaceflight program perspective. And it's sort of been disappointing to me personally to see the moon has kind of been to, gone to a sort of a been there, done that place. And there's been talk about going back to the moon with astronauts or going back to unmanned probes. But you know, there's always some resistance. And what I realized is that one of the big problems we have with the moon is that we have a big picture problem, that the public has almost no idea why the moon is interesting from a science perspective. There may be other rationales for going to the moon. But all I can really do today is talk about the science, but they don't really know. And I would say a lot of planetary scientists, in fact, a lot of people in this room probably are like, why is the moon interesting? Why do we care? Haven't we solved everything? So I'm going to try to make a case for some of these things today about why the moon is interesting. And the thing to keep in mind is that while the moon is an intrinsically interesting place, okay, there's also, if you understand its constraints well, it can be used as a Rosetta Stone telling us about some really key things. First of all, it can tell us a lot about the unknown nature of the primordial Earth. The Earth doesn't have a record that goes back further than about 4 billion years, except for some tiny little zircons. And so if you really want to learn about what the early Earth was like, about the best place to do it is from the Moon. There's also the fact that the Moon, if you read its constraints correctly, can tell you about the last critical stage of the planet formation, which turned out to be far more interesting than you probably think. So I'm going to talk about both aspects of this in this talk today. Okay. And something to keep in mind with this is that the moon probably has the most complete and clear history available of the last four and a half billion years of solar system evolution. And it's also probably the most accessible from the Earth. So there's a lot we can learn from the moon. Okay, so I might begin with a little bit of a prologue before I get into the meat of the talk. So I want to set, up, set the stage for why we're doing some of this. So you know, once upon a time there was a moon. Okay. And if you're dealing with the bombardment history of the moon, we have to talk about the lunar basins. Right? So, this is a picture of the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. You can see some uh, pretty big impact structures here. It turns out from work done by Don Wilhelms and a little bit by Herb Fry more recently, we think there's at least 45 impact basins on the moon, where an impact basin is defined as something larger than about 300 kilometers or so. So these are very, very large impacts. And on the moon, all of these impacts have ages, which are somewhere between about 3.8 billion years ago and about 4.5 billion years ago. Okay, so here's a picture in topography, so you can see some of the basins a little bit better. The one base that really jumps out at you is this big one that's about 2,500 kilometers across called Salt Bowl Aiken Basin. Its age is completely unknown. All we know is that by superposition, it's the oldest and the largest. Okay. So we don't have an age for that. The ages we do have for certain basins, there's only about three which are, I would say, without major disputes. Okay. And those basins are this one right here, the Imbrium Basin, the Serenitatis Basin, and Orientalis over there. And all their ages come back in about 3.8, 3.9 million years ago. And that those ages are very different than when we think the moon formed about 4.5 billion years ago. So there's almost 500 to 600 million years of time between when the moon formed and when these basins formed. And that's an important point that I'll come back to in just a second. Okay. But just to say a little bit more, we also have information on the impact record just from the craters we have in the moon. Okay, so if you have a surface and there's a bunch of craters formed in that surface, if you get a sample from the surface, you can use that date to give you an average impact rate of how many guys have fallen on that surface over time. Now the impact rate could change a lot. It could be very high and nothing and then very high again. You'll never know. But the average impact rate does provide some information. 
And you can also do the reverse. If you understand the impact rate really well, you can go to a surface and predict from the number of craters there how old it is. And that's how we get ages from Mars and from Mercury and from other rocky surfaces. It's all tied back to the moon. So if the moon is wrong, if we interpret things incorrectly, we have our chronology wrong across the solar system. Okay. So when we deal with the moon, this is time before present in billions of years. So here's today. Okay. This is the total number of craters we have larger than about four kilometers per square kilometer. And all these different dots and patches you see are places where we have samples back from terrains that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts or by the Russian Luna spacecraft. And what jumps out at you when you look at this, and there's a lot one could say here, but I'm going to skip the punch, punchline, which is that crater production looks like it was at least 100 times higher than it was today about 4 billion years ago. And that's just about, and at this time, it's just about the time those big basins were being formed. So some big things were happening very early on in human history. In fact, this impact rate might even be higher than this because of crater saturation issues. So, What's going on? Well, and since this has been all developed back in the sort of the Apollo era, the post-Apollo era, there have been sort of two main camps of thought as to what's going on here. The first school of thought is that there's something they call a terminal category. So what this means is that the moon formed, the impact rate dropped off, but the most of its history, the moon has been kind of quiet. And then about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, there was a huge impact spike that created most of the things we see. Okay. So that's one camp. The second camp is uh, what I'm going to call the declining bombardment camp. So in this case, we made the moon, and there were lots of leftover planetesimals. Those leftover planetesimals continued to bombard the moon for hundreds of billions of years. And when they finally ran out, that's when we created the last big basis. And it turns out there's something of a 30 years war that's taking place between <coughs> these camps. They've been fighting, go to literature, they've been fighting and fighting and fighting. And even today, the remnants of those populations are still there. In fact, new people are joining both sides, and they're deadlocked. Okay. It just goes on and on and on. And it all comes down to that the data we have from the moon is just ambiguous enough that you really, it's hard for one side to win versus the other. And so today I'm gonna to try to present some additional information, which I think sets the context for some things. But I'm not gonna necessarily solve this, but I think I'm gonna be able to show that both camps have some merit. And so maybe, you know, maybe there was a reason why the fight should have went on so long. But, um, so we'll go from there. So the outline from this talk is I'm gonna start off with the first half talking a little bit about late accretion on the Earth and Moon and Mars. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about cosmic chemical constraints. I'm a dynamicist, so this is really out of my, you know, what I do. But I've teamed up with people like Rich Walker and James Day. And I've actually been able to, I've been able to use some of these in conjunction with those guys to uh, learn some new things about what was going on very early on in solar system history, which I think is kind of neat. And then the second part of this talk, we're going to talk about the so-called late heaven bombardment. So we're going to talk about what could have produced some of those basins towards the end of, um, uh, uh, toward about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, where we talk about something called the Nice model, which uh, Peter says most of you guys know, but I'll show you again. And then we'll talk about some problems with the Nice model, you know, and then maybe a new solution, which I'm going to propose, which I'm going to call the E belt, which we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so let's start off with late accretion. Okay, so first of all, uh, in order to tell you the story of late accretion, I have to sort of tell you the story of planet formation. Planet formation, we could spend probably an entire year going over all its aspects and still not get to everything. So I can give you a very quick rundown in all about two minutes or so. So for the most part, we're just going to talk about what's going on here in the inner solar system. So what was, what's the story of planet formation that we have in that time period? Okay, well, what we think, this is getting very quick, is that we think a large cloud of gas and dust collapsed, created our protostar, created a sea of gas and dust in a disk. And eventually out of that, we began to grow planetesimals. The new models suggest that planetesimal formation is caused by turbulent concentration regions in the disk. So you get little, you get vortices and uh, ways to get the material together where you go from small objects all the way possibly up to objects maybe hundreds of meters, in, hundreds of kilometers in size scale, all in just maybe a few orbital periods. And over millions of years, you both in a planetesimal to make planets. This is an animation of what would, just by self-gravity, would allow things to bring together. You can imagine lots of collisions in there. That's just sort of to set the tone of this. Okay, so eventually you get to big planetesimals, they begin to hit one another, they grow larger objects, and eventually we get up to protoplanets. So this is an animation where this is distance from the sun, this is mass and earth masses, the little error bars to show how far, how close or how far away these objects come from the sun. And you can see if you start from a population of moon to Mars sized objects, very quickly you get up to Venus or Earth sized masses, and actually the distances from the sun are pretty good. So, while these models have issues, there's lots of things one can talk about here. For the most part, these models don't do a bad job of making our terrestrial planets. Okay. So, during this time, that's all I'll go back straight. So, during this time, 
we have some major protoplanets slamming into one another. And we think one of the most major events that happened here, probably sorry, the most major event that happened on the Earth, is somewhere along the line, an object about half the size of the Earth slammed into the Earth and created our moon. Okay, so this is the moon forming impact. The moon grows out of a protolunar disk and uh, becomes an object which is very depleted in metal, which is heated so it undergoes a magma ocean phase and creates a lot of the things we see on the moon. We think this event happened about 60 million years or so after the formation of the first solids, but there's some big error marks in that. When the moon precisely formed is not very, known very well. But the big thing is that we think that we have our final phase of core formation on the Earth. That's the big formative time when you make the core. The Earth probably already had a core at some level, but that impact drives it home. Okay, and we probably have global magma oceans on both worlds, certainly on the moon. The thinking is we probably had one on the Earth, although how long it lasted isn't really clear. And then that crust starts to build up on the moon. On the Earth, we have a crust that ultimately can be recycled by plate tectonics and things. And so according to the sort of classical model that everyone learns in school, that's it, right? we're done. Okay. At least in terms of what's going on in the interior of the Earth, that seems, some people have suggested that that's about the last time the Earth and the Moon are really influenced by impacts. Okay, at least in the interior. The surface goes through lots of things, but the interior doesn't really, isn't really affected very much. And that's the story. Okay. Well, if that's true, then we have, some, uh, we have a few problems we have to explain. And this takes us to what I'm going to call uh, the, the, the curious case of the highly spherified elements. So this is work that has been, constraints have been known for probably about 30 years or so. And in working with people like Rich Walker and James Day, I've become aware of some of the really interesting issues related to these elements. So what are they? What are highly spherified elements? Well, highly spherified elements are elements that we, you know, we know quite well. They're things like gold and platinum and, and we have iridium and things, and osmium. And these are metals with very high metal to silicon partition coefficients. So what this means is if you have a melt and the metal goes to a certain place, the highly spherified elements love metals and so they really, really want to stay with the metal. And so they go with the metal. Okay. And so it's at such a point that if you have a planetesimal that forms a core, so as the metal drains out to the core, the highly spherified elements should go, as well, go there as well. And so when the Earth had its final big core formation event, most of the highly spherified elements should have drained out. And today, this should only be in the mantle about the 10 to minus 5th level. Okay? And so if that were true, we pretty much all have to wear cheap plastic jewelry. Okay? And the reason is, is that we wouldn't have any gold earth. Okay? Only gold would be in the core, for the most part. Okay? But that's not the case. So something has happened. So what's been pointed out by measuring measurements of, of mantle peridotites from across the, across the planet is that, in fact, we have many more highly spherical elements in our mantle than one would think. So this is a plot showing what the abundance we have in our mantle versus CI chondrate, so it's a very primitive type of carbonaceous chondrate. These are different, um, different highly spherified elements. And you can see this plot here, it shows that the Earth is a fairly flat distribution, almost as if we have the same signature as carbonaceous chondrates. Okay. And the fact that we're down is not 10 to the minus fifth, but it's actually only about a factor of 200 down from where, uh, where chondrates are today. Mars has something <laughs> of a similar signature. We get this from derivative mills from Mars. And the Moon even has a surprisingly more than we think. The moon's down about a factor of 20 with respect to the Earth, but still much higher than what one would expect if you had a major melting event on the moon with the magma ocean and everything, you know, all the metals going into the core and the rest. So we have a major difference between these two. Okay? So how do we get this? This takes us to a topic which we're going to refer to as late accretion. So there's lots of rationales that have been proposed for how one would get this abundance we have in the Earth and the abundance we have in the moon. And they talk about possibly the elements being partitioned in different ways and the rest. And I'm not going to go through all of this. This is more, you know, there's, there's a great review paper by Rich Walker. He goes into all the subtleties and details of this, but I just don't have time to talk about that. What I'm going to focus on is probably the one that has the least fleas today. And that's the mechanism, the idea of late accretion. Okay, so what is late accretion? So this is a simulation of semi direct or this is a semi direct to success and Christie. This is a simulation very similar to what I just showed you. So here you have about a sea of planetesimals, a sea of protoplanets. These are moon to Mars sized objects. And we're going to actually make the terrestrial planets here. So here's Jupiter over here. So let me just start this. Okay. So what you see is that the, the embryos start to perturb one another, they get excited, and you ultimately start making the terrestrial planets here. And eventually, at some point in here, we have the moon forming impact take place. So we have the moon forming impact. So that's when the core gets set for the Earth. So over here, that represents the Earth going from this to something like this. But you'll notice that even though we have the Earth here, we have all these green guys still flying around. These are planetesimals that are left over in the system. So after this event, you're still going to have planetesimals landing on the Earth. But the core of the Earth is, is we think, for the most part, is complete. So if you add stuff in after the last core formation event, 
we call this late accretion, you can actually possibly add back in chondritic material. And also you're adding it back in maybe highly spherical elements. So there's a way to deliver that material late in the game. Okay. So this was first suggested by I think it's called Cho back in 1978. And people have been fighting about this for years and years and years. Okay. So this is actually, if you go to literature, this is often referred to as the late veneer issue. Okay. So you're adding a late veneer to the earth. We decided we don't want to use the term late veneer because it brings up all sorts of issues about water delivery and everything else. And we think late accretion is a more apt term. So I'm, I'm going to see late accretion for the rest of the talk. Okay. So how much mass do we need? When we get the Earth uh, composition, if we get, get what we need for the Earth, we need about 0.5% of the Earth's mass to be added in. Okay. So if you have a diameter of projectile here, here's the number of projectiles, this gives you a feeling for how much stuff has to be added to the Earth. You can see you might need projectiles that are thousands of kilometers across, or you might just need not lots and lots of little guys. Okay. The moon is about a factor, is, is a factor much lower than this. And it turns out, in order to get this right, you have to have a, a, a mass difference between your moon delivery of about a factor of 1,200. Okay. So that doesn't, you know, at first base, that seems weird for this reason. Okay. That if you, this is a scale model of the Earth and the moon. And actually, you can see that their cross sections are not that different from one another. In fact, the typical cross section you have difference, if you count in the gravity of the Earth and the rest, is only about a factor of 20 between these two. So 20 things hit the Earth for every one thing that hits the moon. Well, a factor of 20 is very, very different than this factor of 1,200. Okay? So how do you get such an enormous mass difference if you're going to do all this by the, by the, by the late accretion? Well, one possibility is that impactors come in and hit the moon, and all the material that they, they deliver to the moon, for the most part, goes flying back off into space. And so also when you build up a very different ratio. And that could be true. Okay? But the problem is, is when people have looked at this from a numerical perspective, they've actually had impact simulations where they've used hydrocodes, model things coming into the moon, and they want to see what stays behind. For the most part, the <coughs> loss of material from comets and asteroids, which we think are in orbits, like the orbits they would have during uh, the late accretion phase, they probably, in the end, are only losing about 40% of the mass. And so that's enough to move the factor of 1,200 to about 700, but not much more than that. You still have a very big difference between this ratio and the 20 to 1 ratio we have. So something's going on. Okay, so this was the problem that was presented to me by uh, Rich Walker and James Day. And they said, well, what do you think about this? And I thought, well, you know, I thought about it for a bit. And I go, you know, this can't be that hard to model. In fact, it's really easy to come up with a little quick Monte Carlo um, model for this. So this is what I did. And what I did is I just took a size distribution of materials. So this is log of diameter. This is the log of the number of objects you have in your population. And I just wanted to see, well, what populations could possibly give us a factor of about 700 or so okay, between the Earth and the Moon? So just for the reference, this is, uh, if you have a size distribution over here, a steep size distribution means that most of the mass is in the little guys. And there aren't actually like many big guys. Okay. If you have a shallow distribution, that means most of your mass is in the big guys, and the little guys don't actually have a lot of mass. So we're going to test all these sorts of things just to see what we get. So, so here's a little Monte Carlo code I put together. So what you're looking at are different trials. The reason they dance around is that each one corresponds to, uh, to just a, a trial where I try different random numbers, and I chose projectiles from each population. I just wanted to see what happened. So in this case, we have about 100 projectiles hitting the moon. We have about 2,000 hitting the Earth. So we're using a 20 to 1 ratio. These are the different size distributions you get. And this is the mass fraction you get on each world. Okay, so hard to me, the mass ratio. So this is Earth moon mass ratio. And you can see, when you have a lot of projectiles, you really can't get very far away from this factor 20. So you know, that means for a steep population, lots of projectiles, you really can't get what we need for constraints. So that's okay. So we thought, well, let's just cut down the number of projectiles. Maybe we'll let random, you know, randomness work in our favor a little bit. So in this case, we cut down the number of impactors to, on the moon hitting to about two. That means about 40 on the Earth. That means there's more mass in every projectile. And here, we actually started to get a little bit better results. You can see for all our cases, we're still not at a factor of 700, but we're better. Okay? We're getting up in the, in the stages of 100 every so often, just because the Earth might just happen to be hit by some big things that, in the end, don't hit the moon. Okay? So that's good. So then we try, well, let's try a shallow population where most of our mass is in big guys. So this allows sort of random, random chance to work in our advantage, to work to our favor for the most as possible. And here you can see now we start beating constraints by a lot. Okay? So about 30% of the time, we're actually exceeding this in this model just because you have, tw you have 20 big guys that are hitting the Earth, and only occasionally does something sizable hit the moon. For the most part, it might not get something sizable. So if you put that all together, what we found, so this is our total distribution. So this is uh, this is slope. So here most of the mass is in the little guys. Here most of the mass is in the big guys. This is the fraction we have that, produce, that reproduce constraints. And you can see for some cases, 
for shallow populations, we end up managing the urine balloon about 40% of the time. So that's, that, that's kind of a cute result. That would suggest that late accretion has a very shallow component where most of the mass is in the big guys, if this is right. But you know, while this is cute, that's really all it is is cute because you have to have another rationale to, to go forward with this. So what we did is then I started to look, and I started to think about this, and I said, well, there are other examples of where we have populations in the inner solar system that might be represented by shallow size distributions. And so what I remembered is that uh, just, about a, just about a year ago or so, uh, a colleague of mine, Alessandro Morbidelli, and myself and several others, we published a paper where we were looking at how accretion works in the inner solar system. And so what we did in this case is we created a lot of planetesimals, we let them accrete together, we wanted to see the size distributions we would get from that. So in this case, we started off with a population that was dominated by 100 kilometer guys. And what happens is these 100 kilometer objects begin to merge and get bigger, and eventually we end up with something which looks like this. So a steep population then has a very shallow component at the largest sizes. I'm going to call this, uh, this the foot, okay? Because you see a size which kind of looks like a foot. How many can I touch? You can say it's a hockey stick. <laughs> Uh, to any event, it's the size distribution that we get from this simulation is about, uh, is about a slope of about minus two, and that's just about what we need to get the best case results we have for the Earth and Moon. So I thought, boy, that's interesting. Now we have two components that seem to go together. But there's an issue, right? This is just from accretion. This population should undergo lots of collisional evolution, so maybe that will change things. So we put collisional evolution in this code to see how this population would evolve. So this is collisional evolution treating things as well as we can as to how, how these big guys should disrupt in the inner solar system with the kinds of collision probabilities and impact velocities we should have. And what we find is that this foot doesn't really change shape. And the reason is it's really hard to blow up the big guys. If you have an object the size of the series, but the only way to break it up is to hit it with the series. Okay, or it gets to be bigger. You have to almost hit it with the same size or larger. And it just doesn't allow you to really change the size distribution very much once you make it. You can change the little guys much more easily than you can the big guys. So this foot, once you make it, seems to be pretty, pretty um, straightforward. Or excuse me, seems to be pretty robust. Now, these are, there's some other curves here I'm showing. And let me just do this for a second. There's two other curves here where I decided to look for things. So I said, well, what else can we say in terms of planetesimal formation? What other evidence do we have? Well, one reservoir of planetesimals we still have remaining to us is the asteroids in the asteroid belt. And I wanted to look at the asteroids in the inner part of the asteroid belt, because they're the closest to the terrestrial planet region. So what I did is I looked at asteroids that were inside from about 2.8 AU or so. And that's represented by this purple curve here. Okay, so the purple curve comes down to about 250 kilometers or so. And then what happens is it jumps all the way out to two asteroids, Vesta and Pallas, which are about 500 kilometers. There's nothing in between. And then it jumps all the way out to Ceres, which is almost uh, 900 to 1,000 kilometers across. So if you look at that size distribution right in here, that foot is the same as all the other populations we're getting. Now this red curve is actually interesting. We, it turns out there's a record on Mars. Mars has one of the most ancient records of impact basins we have in the inner solar system. And Herb Fry has recently found a lot of big impact basins on Mars using various means to, to sort of tease out what the size of these guys should be from altimeter readings and all the rest. And the size of that, uh, the biggest basins we have on Mars, when you put them to a scaling law, you print them back into a projectile distribution, also has a very shallow component, the same way the inner main belt does, and the same way all these other populations do. So this is right, There's, there seems to be lots of different signs that the the, the accretion population in the inner solar system had a very shallow component where lots of mass was in there, and that probably went all the way up to planetary embryos. So if that's true, we may have a way to explain this curious abundance of highly spherical elements we have in the Earth and Moon. So that's kind of nice. But it does, make some, it does have some implications. Okay. So if this is right, if we take our size distribution, we can make a prediction. That's the largest things to hit the Earth and Moon and Mars after they, after they formed and went through their final core formation event. If this is right, we predict that the Earth should have been hit by something almost 3,000 kilometers across. That's a big guy. Okay? Uh, the Moon should have been hit by something on the order of about 250 to 300 kilometers or so. May have been hit by more than one, but probably not a lot more than one. In Mars, we have a projectile size of about 1,500 to 1,800 kilometers. So those are big objects. So if you have such big objects hitting the Earth, what do they do? Well, they might be that. Okay? They probably don't. Okay? So I, I had to show that. But so. The question we had when we started to talk to some people about this is they said, well, why does an old, and this projectile that you're going to have hit the Earth is huge. It probably has an iron core. Why does not all the iron just go to the core, just like what happened in the moon forming impact? And the answer is, I don't actually know, because the modeling is very, very difficult to do. But we do know something about how impacts work for big objects. And the way they work is very much what we call a, we call a hit and almost run. 
This is new work that's been done by Eric Aslan that's been published in the last few years. If you have something hit a big object and it's differentiated, what happens in some cases is the projectile actually plows right through the target and actually makes a sort of long filament-like structure. And you notice that most of the iron that was in the projectile starts to, roll, starts to go into this long structure. And then what happens is it all starts to reaccrete on the surface of the body, kind of gets rolled up. The nice thing about this is this would mean that the iron in the projectile would get fragmented to very small sizes, so it would actually have a hope of being emulsified on the surface. It also rains back and covers the surface of the earth almost uniformly. Okay? So there may be ways to put lots of iron close to the surface of the earth, where then it can sort of gradually be brought into the mantle in smaller chunks that could possibly keep it out of the core. So this is right. This actually has some big implications as to what's going on in early accretion during when, when differentiated fine test motors slamming into one another. So the real physics of what happens with the small guys is hard to say. It's just beyond our ability to do modeling or so. But I don't find this thing implausible. So I think it's something to think about. Okay. Um, in terms of late accretion affecting um, uh, the Earth's other parameters, we looked at how, what the biggest objects would do to Earth's obliquity. And it would actually change it by about 10 degrees. So that's actually well within the constraints. Earth's obliquity right now is about 23 degrees or so. So that fits pretty well. Uh, what's interesting is if you had an impact happen very shortly after uh, the moon forming event, this could actually explain the inclination of the moon's orbit. You can imagine the moon forming in the equatorial plane of the Earth. The Earth gets hit and gets its obliquity changed. That would actually induce a small inclination on the moon, which would be about what we need. Okay? Now I point out, though, that Robin Knuff and Bill Ward in my office have suggested that the inclination of the moon probably comes from, from interactions between the protolunar disk and a newly forming moon. And I would say that's the most likely scenario. So this scenario is sort of a fallback position in case in the end their model just doesn't work because the protolunar disk is too short. -lived. So we'll go from there. Okay. So what about the moon? Well, the, uh, an impactor about the size of 250 to 300 kilometers or so is actually about the right size we need to make South Pole Lake and Basin. So this is right. It would suggest that South Pole Lake and Basin is a basin that's, that's left over from accretion. It wasn't made 4 billion years ago. It was probably made 4.4 or, or such billion years ago or so. Now there's also a suggestion, and I, I'm, this is really, really speculative, but some people have suggested that the near side of the moon is very different from the far side of the moon because it was hit by something big very early on in its history. Okay. And so they've suggested that they call this the so-called Procellarum Basin. No one knows how big it was, but maybe a lot of things about the near side of the moon are different because of this big impact. I don't know if this is true, but if you had an impact that was delivering highly syrup elements to the moon, it would probably hit when the moon was still very hot, would still have the ability to have a, to produce a basin that would viscously relax. So it could be that this Procellarum basin is real. The sizes we need to make this basin, about 200 or 300 kilometers or so, is not terribly different than what would actually produce something like this. So I don't say this must be true. I just say it's something we need to think about. OK. So just in, in, given that we're speculating a little bit, let me just uh, suggest something else that's kind of interesting with this. OK. Um, it's been recently reported that the moon in its deep mantle May actually have a finite, uh, might, might have a certain amount of water. Okay, that, and we wanted to say, well, you know, people have usually assumed that the water comes through the protolunar disk from the Earth. So you make the moon, the water has to go through this hot and very vaporized disk and ultimately get into the interior of the moon. That may be very hard to do. So can it actually come from late accretion? Well, if you assume the projectile that hits the moon is this size, and then it has about the same amount of water as it comes from, from our dry meteorites, like an ordinary chondrate or an insulate chondrate. So we're only assuming about 0.1 weight percent water, so it's really low. And you mix it in the upper mantle, you actually get about 1 to 3 ppm weight percent water in, in the lunar mantle. And that's about the same as being measured from uh, work by McCubbins and some others. There's some, there's some issue as to how much water might be in the moon, but the amount of water we're talking about here is really low, and that seems to match some of these limits. So it could very well be that the water we see in the deep interior of the moon was added in, just like the highly syrup elements were added in, and it may have come from this late accretion phase. So what about Mars? Okay, well, recently, it's, well, I should say, in order to get the highly sterile abundance we need for Mars, we need to accrete about 2.6 times 10 to the 21st uh, kilograms. Okay. And according to our size distribution, that would correspond with a projectile that's about 15 to 800 kilometers in size. It turns out this projectile size is just about what we need to make a very large Borealis basin. And recently, Jeff Andrews Hanna and his colleagues, and Francis Nemo and uh, Marinova et al have made an argument that an impactor this big is needed to explain the global dichotomy you see on Mars. So you have a very big projectile come in, and the reason the north and southern hemispheres of Mars are very different is because a giant impact basin was produced. I'm arguing that that basin may be consistent also with the highly, highly severe element abundance we see. So, something else to consider. 
So let's assume all this is right. This has been uh, kind of a fun exercise to go through and, and seems to match up a lot of things. So if one were going to argue that late accretion were important for highly stochastic elements, you would probably say at least some of the earliest basins <coughs> on the moon, like South Pole Aiken Basin, were from late accretion. So can late accretion make all the basins? Maybe the, maybe the people talk about the declining bombardment were right. Well, we decided to look at that. So the question is, can late accretion make these guys we have right here, these really old basins? So what we did is we did this work actually a couple years ago. We took a population in the inner solar system. We allowed it to evolve and hit the planets over an extended period of time in the inner solar system. And then we put in a collisional evolution model, which allowed the stuff to collisionally grunt and wanted to see what happened. So we stuck in all sorts of initial masses, and we wanted to see how it would fall off. So this is time after the moon forming event. This is the number of basins you get. And in between these yellow lines is where Embry and Marie and Cal forms. So we have to make basins here if this model is going to work. But what we found, though, is that the LHB, or this population, actually just self-destructs. Collisional grinding is so efficient that if you have a lot of mass in this population, you just can't stay there very long. So while you can make some very, very early basins on the moon, you're probably not making these late basins we see. We predict about 0.02 basins should come from this, and we see two. And so you can rule out almost a three signal level. So what that means is that in some fashion, while we might get early basins, we need something else, maybe a cataclysm, to make these late basins we see on the moon. And so, and so if that's true, many of these younger basins, which we call nectarian basins, may have had to come from a cataclysm. And actually, I think that makes sense from another perspective as well. So I am not a planetary, I wouldn't call myself a planetary geologist. I've had some background, but not much. So what I'm going to say here is probably very simplistic. But if you look at the oldest basins we have in the moon, we call pre-nectarian. Um, so here are some, some just sample images I found on the web, kind of playing around a little bit. They're all very, very subdued features. I'm not even sure if they show up very well here. But they have no, almost no topographic signature. You really have to look for subtle signs to see these things. And I've gone back to the original works where people discovered these. And you know, it's really, really tough work. On the nectarian basins, which are younger, you see rims, you see topographic relief. And there's some suggestion that maybe these oldest basins were formed when the crust was much more warm. Maybe the more recent ones were formed in a more colder crust. At the very least, there seems to be a big time difference between these guys and these guys. They probably all weren't made within, let's say, a couple of tens of millions of years of one another. So there would be a suggestion, or at least it's consistent with the idea, that early basins and, let in, and uh, more younger basins really have enough of a time difference to <coughs> suggest that two mechanisms may be involved here. Okay. So that's as much as I'm going to say about that part. So we're all just going to be part one at this point. So I hope you're not exhausted yet. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to make the late basins and what may be going on with that. So there's a lot one could say here. So let's jump right in. So earlier, oh, so one thing, so earlier in the talk, I said that said things about the late heaven bombardment okay, in terms of craters, in terms of big impact basins. When did it all start? When was the beginning of this population of time? If we need a cataclysm, okay. And something I want to bring up here, and even though I'm a dynamicist, I thought I should say this. I think it's fun. Is that um, you know every now and then you'll see in the literature, or you'll see someone in the press saying, you know, why do we want to go back to the moon for rocks? You know, don't we have enough? We have a lot of rocks on Earth. Isn't that enough? Shouldn't you be happy? So, you know, you know, one rock's as good as another. But the thing to keep in mind, that always sort of infuriates me, is a rock is maybe the most efficient way to encode information about a planet. Okay? You can learn an amazing amount from just the rock, right rocks from the right places. Okay? And that's actually what we've done from the moon, to be able to infer an amazing amount. And think about how much we've been able to infer about Mars just from the limited number of Martian meteorites we have. So, rocks are cool. So what we did, so one of the things that, that drove this whole discussion we're having today is some of the rocks we brought back from the moon. Now originally when the Apollo, uh, when the Apollo scientists uh, were thinking about this, they thought that the rocks that we have from the moon should probably almost all be about the same age as the meteorites we have. The thinking was the moon probably formed shortly after accretion, and so the thinking was all the rocks should be about four and a half billion years old or so. Okay? But that's actually not what we found. Well, we found a few samples that really go back in time, so they may represent the very early lunar crust. Most of our ages are much younger than that. And in fact, most of our ages seem to have been affected in some fashion by impacts. And the, the age range of all these rocks is somewhere between about 3.7 and 4.1. Now, we have some big impact notes here you see in the red. These are from R and Argentine. And they tend to cluster here about 3.8 to 4 billion years or so. Okay, so there's some suggestion, again, for something late happening on the moon that's very big. But we do have a problem, okay, that we may be biased. Okay, so here's where all the places where the Apollo astronauts went okay, and collected samples. And here's where some of the Russian lunar spacecraft went. And they're all very, very close to this big, late basin called Imbrian. 
Imbrium has, Imbrium is one of the largest basins we have in the moon. It's also one of the latest, so there's a good chance that material from Imbrium covered these regions, or at least affect the rock in some fashion. So thinking many of our samples are just seeing Imbrium again and again and again. Okay, so it's hard to know exactly if we've interpreted all the stuff we have from the moon correctly. So we have to be careful. Okay? So for this reason, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some other ages that we have and other terrains that may tell us about what may possibly be going on. So we're going to talk about some of the meteorites rates we have from Mars. Okay? Now, there's a lot one can say here, and we don't have a lot of data, so I have to be careful about statistics of small numbers. But this is the interpretation people have of some of these rocks. The oldest meteorite rate we have from Mars is the famous Allen Hills A4001. And for many, many years, we thought that this age went back almost to the formation of Mars, about four and a half billion years ago. But there's a new work uh, by Lapid et al. in 2010 that suggests the crystallization age for Allen Hills is about 4.1 billion years. And others who are experts I've talked to argue these are the correct ages because they worry that some of the older ages that were done as best they could by very good people like Larry Nyquist and the rest, um, they may have been affected by water. There's a lot of suggestion of or carbonate phases and other things in Allen Hills that may have actually affected some of the chronometers they have. Um, the chronometers used here have apparently are superior to the ones used in other places. That's about as much as I can say as being a dynamicist. But there's a suggestion again about 4.1 inch. With phases inside the rocks, it suggests lots of interesting things happening between about 3.9 and 4.1. Now there's another set of meteorites called the sugar types. The sugar types have very young ages, maybe about 150 to 200 million years or so. But a couple years ago, there was a, a group from France that came out and said they were getting lead lead ages in the sugar types that were about 4.1. Now, all the rest of the cosmochemical chemical community attacked them and said, this is nuts, this can't be true. And there were lots of fights about this. Now, eventually, it's all kind of settled down. And I think everyone agrees that the rocks are young. But if you talk to the cosmochemists that were you know, asked, well, what, what are they seeing here? They think somehow the source region for the sugar types may have been disturbed at about 4.1. So even though the rocks themselves are young, these lead lead ages are going back in time and seeing something else happen. So we have sort of an issue where we're seeing 4.1 in two different rocks here, <coughs> which is kind of interesting. We also have rocks from um, asteroids and the asteroid belt. So this is uh, the asteroid Vesta. We think a lot of our Ukraine landing on the surface are coming from Vesta. Okay? And what we have here is that these are the age targets we have from lots of different um, uh, samples of Ukraine. These are ungratiated, these are gratiated. And what we find is that these ages tend to go from about 4.1 down to about 3.3 or so. So they're a little bit longer than the impact signature we have in the moon. But the start of this seems to be roughly about the same place. Okay, so there's a suggestion, again, that 4.1 seems to be showing up again. If we look at each chondrites, these are another type of uh, country meteorite. These are the shock ages we have from these, so this is when they were affected by impacts. These are some early ages, but if we go over here to these very old ages, they also tend to have a time when they sort of close for their formation, kind of a lull, and then about 4.1, things seem to pick up here again. There's some other meteorite classes that show similar ages. So I know this was sort of a whirlwind tour, but I think the summary of the data suggests that there was some kind of bombardment of them that affected these worlds, and it appears that it may have started about 4.1. So that's a different time than, let's say, what's suggested for the Imbrium age and the Serenitas age of about 3.9. It's a little bit older than that. But I think that's the beat that comes out from the, from the literature of all these different samples across the board. Okay, so then you don't have to worry about being affected by biases by like Imbrium and Trinitatis and the rest. Okay. The major lunar events seem to have lasted until about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. But in the asteroid belt, they extended the longer ages. And that's an interesting the rationale as to why they're um, extended is uh, something fun that may be in the question period. But I don't have time to talk about that. Okay. And most of the evidence for the spike that we have, that everyone talks about, mainly comes from samples found near Imbrium and Serenitatis. Okay, so we really could be biased there. I think that's something we have to keep in mind. Okay. So, how do we get, uh, regardless of what you're doing, how do we get a spike of factors? How do we get a cataclysm? To do that, we have to go to what's going on in the outer solar system. Okay. So, we have to talk about all the events happening up here for a little bit. Okay. And there's a lot one could say here, and if I had another hour, I'd spend a whole hour just dealing with uh, all the issues with the so-called East <laughs> But I don't have time, so I'm just going to try to give you the quick rundown of what's going on here. So this was a model that was developed by four people. Alessandro Morbidelli, uh, Hal Levison, Clementus Saganis, and Rodney Gomez. And they did this all when they were, most of them were on sabbatical in East France. And so you can see, you know, it's it was a really hard place. You know, you guys are in Canada, I see this place around here. You can see the awful working conditions they had. You know, they had to deal with, like, horrible views and terrible food and, you know, all sorts of things. But somehow they managed to get science done, right? So, um, but what they did 
is um, they came up with a new model of how the solar system may have worked. Okay? So in our original model, we have the giant planets forming all pretty much where we see them today. And over and beyond that, we have the Kuiper belt and scattered disk, and these are sort of our comet populations. And for years and years, we've tried to make, in our planet formation codes, everything work where we see them today. But it turns out these models have big issues. We cannot make Uranus and Neptune where they see, we see them today in our codes. Okay? We just can't make them. Uranus and Neptune take more than the age of the solar system to form. We can't make some of the biggest objects we see out here, like Pluto and Eris and the rest, because we just don't have enough mass in our comet populations. The orbits of Jupiter and Saturn are actually wrong in these models compared to what our code suggests. So there's all sorts of issues. And so ultimately, in dealing with all these issues, uh, people in these decided to try something radical to deal with our problems. And that was this. Okay, so here what we're suggesting is that the giant planets form in a more compact configuration. So between, rather than being between about 5 and 30 AU or so, we're now just dealing with maybe 5 and about 50 to 20 AU or so. And then rather than having a tiny little disk of uh, icy planetesimals, we're now talking about a disk that's maybe on the order of about 30 Earth masses, or 35 Earth masses of, of cometary material. So there's a lot of stuff here. So why do we like this? Well, the advantage is Uranus and Neptune can now start to form over reasonable time scales. And so now all of a sudden they have enough time to get the gas from the disk and become the planets we see today. We also now have enough mass out here we can make things like Pluto and Eris and the rest. So there's a lot of things to like. Okay? The downside is that the planets are in completely the wrong place. And we have all this mass we've got to get rid of. So what do we do? Okay. So, so what they did is they decided, well, let's just model this and see. So this is what you're looking at here is the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They've all been started on completely circular orbits, kind of the way you expect the planets, to, the orbits they would have after they grab gas from the disk. Beyond this, you have a, a disk mass of about 35 Earth masses. And you'll notice that, the, that this disk, you see these little green guys flying around. What's happening is this disk is losing mass. Comets are interacting with this, uh, this object here. They're being passed down to Jupiter, and Jupiter's throwing them out of the solar system. And so because all these planets are interacting with comets, they're actually migrating. And these objects here are migrating outward, and Jupiter's migrating inward a little bit. And so when Jupiter, or when Saturn, it's very close to this dashed line, in in this dashed line, some really interesting things happen. So this, will, this is going to all go in just a second. So take a look. So this is what they refer to as the next model when you see it. So what did you just see? Okay, now, and I'll, I'll show another animation so you can get a little bit better. So what's happening here is that uh, the inner world, uh, Jupiter, uh, is going around the sun twice. For every time Saturn is going around once. That's what happens when they get into that dashed line. So they enter into a resonance with one another. And you notice that at these crosshairs, the planets always meet at the same place, the same geometry. So the gravitational kicks always have the same geometry. And so what happens is over many, many orbits, all these gravitational kicks build up, and they can actually change the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. And so what do you think happened, okay, is that Jupiter and Saturn migrate out, migrate out, and when they got in this resonance, all of a sudden they change orbits just enough to destabilize Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune migrate into the disk, and they basically cause the disk to go kablooey. Okay, and that's actually the scientific term, it's kablooey. <laughs> <laughs> and so they migrate out to where we see them today. And so all of a sudden, you go from the giant planets having this compact configuration to being spread out, and the disk has been sent all across the solar system. Okay. So this seems kind of wild. You know, the question is, you know, is this right? Okay. And one of the reasons why we think we like it, or one of the reasons why we think it's a reasonable thing, is that this is a plot in the major axis, and that's the inclination, of the giant planets. The blue dots are our are, are giant planets. Blue, blue, blue. And then the red are different simulations you get from the Mies model by slightly tweaking the initial conditions. And you notice that in semi-major axis and eccentricity inclination, the match is really remarkable. Okay? And there's no other model we have today that's even close to being this successful. Okay? No one else can do this. And so the fact we're getting such nice matches here suggests there really is something going on. But it, and the main parameter here that we're, you know, that we're going to have to deal with is uh, the mass of the disk that affects where the plants end up going. And then to some degree, the initial conditions of where the planets start. And that's something that's being worked on right now. But so for the last five years or so, myself and others have been beating on this model, trying to see if it works. Okay. And as I tell people, these are all close friends of mine. So if I could prove they were wrong, I would do it in a second, so it'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you just turn the knife, you're wrong. Ah, you that. But we've been beating on this for five years. And every time we think we find some way to show it's wrong, not only does the Mies model pass, but it passes with flying colors and it makes predictions that we didn't expect. Okay. 
And this has happened so many times that I think I've convinced myself that regardless of what happens, some, some version of this model is going to go on. So some of the things that this model predicts, it gives us the right size distribution and the right orbital distribution of the Trojan asteroids, the Hilda asteroids, many Kuiperville objects. It can explain why we have irregular satellites around the giant planets and their orbit and size distributions. Uh, it can tell us interesting things, like for example, why is Ganymede differentiated while Callisto was not? It could be that impacts produce that difference. That's some work that Amy Barr, is, Barr, uh, Amy Barr and Robin Knuck have just published. And I could go on and on and on. There's so again, lots you could say. So there's lots of things to like about this. But I'm supposed to be talking about the moon and the bottom of the moon. And so that means I have to talk a little bit about the asteroid belt. So what happens to the asteroid belt in this model? Well, because the giant planets are all sliding around and moving around, all the resonances that they have are also moving around. And so what we believe happens is that when the giant planets move to their current locations, resonances like the new secular resonance migrate across the asteroid belt. And so what they do is they start to liberate things. So things get thrown out of the asteroid belt. So the late heaven bombardment then is not just, at, not just comets, but it's comets and asteroids. Comets hit first in a very narrow spike, and then there's this long tail of asteroids that bombard the planets. And the amount that's lost from the asteroid belt depends on how fast this line goes across. If it goes across very slow, you lose a lot of mass. If it goes across really fast, only a little bit is lost. And so in the original Mies model, they proposed something like this. So the red dot, the red lines, excuse me, are comets hitting the moon, and the blue guys are the asteroids hitting. And what they found is everything works out wonderfully, and it's a whole beautiful scenario. And the only thing they need is for the asteroid belt to be about 10 to 20 times its current mass, and it all works out. And so when it was originally published, I don't think I realized that I didn't think as much as hard about this issue, and no one really knew. So I thought, well, this is a plausible case. Okay, so this is sort of where it was for several years. But now we sort of reached a point where you can start to think about this a little bit. And it turns out that trying to keep an asteroid belt 10 to 20 times its current population for 500 million years is hard. It's hard to make that work, and for a couple different reasons. Okay, one is collisionally, that population wants to grind down, and I've actually recently shown that you just can't do it. But I won't talk about that today because that's another story. Uh, oh, I, I almost forgot to mention this. Okay. Another reason to like asteroids hitting uh, on the moon is that the size distribution of stuff hitting Mars and Mercury and the moon has a slope which is very similar to what we'd expect coming out of the asteroid belt. This is the shape of the asteroid belt in this, what we call an R plot. So what's happened is that you've taken the size distribution and then divide by a continuum so you can sort of really see the wiggles and things. And all these wiggles you see here are what we get from the craters on some of the oldest trains on the moon, and the red, and I believe, let's see, um, the red dots are the craters, excuse me, and these blue and black ones are what the actual population of the asteroid belt is. So there's a really nice match, and the suggestion is, this was worked on by Bob Strom, is that the asteroids had to come out of the asteroid belt by some mechanism that was size independent. So it was pulling out big guys and little guys equally, and that's why we get this very nice shape. So that also seems to work pretty well, with saying asteroids are a big component of the LHP. Now, now I'm going to talk about problems. So, we have, so you know, it's a happy story, but we have our issues. And the first issue is related to what I just said. Okay, so they need a very massive asteroid belt to lose a lot of stuff, but in the end, they have to make the asteroid belt we see today. So this is the asteroid belt we see today. This is a semi-major axis, this is inclination. And all these red dots are where we have the biggest asteroids, about 50 kilometers or so. So they're not affected by non-gravitational forces. Of the and you'll notice, that very few of these objects are at high inclinations. Okay. So if you actually take the model that they suggested, you run the resonances across the asteroid belt, you end up making the asteroid belt look like this. And this was recent work that was done by Alessandro Morbidelli, and very related work has been done by um, David Mitten and Renu Malhaya in a recent Nature paper. And what you find is you put a whole bunch of asteroids at really high inclinations. We don't see that, so this is bad. Okay. You also, we also get big gaps in the asteroid belt. We don't see that either. So what that does, that means that the classic <coughs> use model, as was first presented, can't be right because we're not reproducing the asteroid belt. So what can be done? Well, it turns out there are mechanisms where you can get the resonances to sweep across the asteroid belt really, really fast. Okay? And um, there's a recent paper out by Alessandro Morbidelli and Ramon Grosser and some others called the Jumping Jupiter Scenario. And I won't go into all the details of that. It's it's basically, Jupiter has lots of encounters with giant planets, which cause them to sweep very fast and quickly. But the end result is if, if resonance sweep across the asteroid belt extremely quickly, they don't produce a lot of dynamical damage. And so the asteroid belt they get looks like the asteroid belt we see, which is nice. Okay? See? We don't have all these high inclination guys anymore. The downside of this, though, is that the asteroid belt only loses about half its mass. If it only loses about half its mass, you don't have enough to make all the basins we see in the moon. 
So all of a sudden, we've gone from having a perfect story where everything works out to now all of a sudden being in big trouble. We can't make the bridge, we can't make many of the things we see in the movie. So how do we fix this? Okay. So as I said, the main belt has only lost about half its mass, and that's only enough to maybe produce on the order of about two or three lunar pieces. <laughs> Just not enough to get everything. Uh, but yet, we seem to have this evidence from Bob Strom and other rationale, we'll go into in just a second, that suggests that asteroids were a big part of the late heaven of Mark. Okay, so, how do we deal with this? Okay. So this takes us to the final part of the talk, you know, if you've made it this far, which is what I'm going to call this E-belt, which I think may be the missing link in some of this. Okay. So there's something, there's, so there's additional, some additional constraints we haven't really thought about in terms of how to make, in terms of what's going on with the late heaven of that I think needs to be part of the story. And first of all, when we go to the moon and we brought back samples from uh, the Apollo astronauts brought back samples, it turns out that the moon is so depleted in metals that when things hit the moon, they actually can, they actually can take some of the impact melts and the rest. You can say something about the nature of the projectiles and making different basins. And for at least the basins, Imbrium and Serenitatis, what we find is that the, the most likely composition of their projectiles is not sort of your run-of-the-mill asteroid or your run-of-the-mill carbonaceous chondrite or ordinary chondrite. They actually think Imbrium was probably made by an iron projectile. Okay. And they think the Serenitatis Basin was probably made by something very similar to Ensotype Conrads. Okay. That's what you're showing here. So some of these, these little circles here, this is for different uh, highly spherical elements. These little uh, brackets here are some of the samples we have back from the moon. And all these dots are different meteorites we have plotted up here. You can see here's Ensotype Conrads, and you can see some of those falling within this envelope. Here's iron meteorites falling within that envelope, that sort of thing. This is an old plot, but it still sort of represents the current, um, current thinking on things. The issue is, is that these are very exotic forms of impact force. You know, but since you know, Peter and the others do meteorite groups here, they know a lot about meteorite falls. Most of our meteorite falls today are ordinary chondrates and carbonaceous chondrates. Things like anstite chondrates and irons are, are popular at some level, but they're not, still not, they won't dominate the supply. But they also don't dominate the asteroid belt. This is a semi-major axis. This is the abundance of different types of asteroids we have in the asteroid belt. Out here we have really, really primitive things. Like, so these are almost dormant comet-like things, D's and P's. The C types are very primitive things, like maybe like Matilda and the rest. Okay? And then as you go closer in, you start to get more S-type things. These are things that are maybe more like ordinary chondrates, but they have other compositions as well. But in general, there seems to be a suggestion as you go in the asteroid belt, you get more heating and more thermal, thermal metamorphism as you go in towards here. But again, objects like iron, iron asteroids and S-type asteroids are not something that are very common. Okay. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that if you go inside the asteroid belt to a little population in here we call the Hungarians, it's not very big, but this population seems to be dominated by more E-type asteroids. These are things that are more similar to S-type chondrates and S-type A chondrates, and there may be some evidence this population has some degree of metal component as well. So if one were looking across the asteroid belt for a representative sample of the things that would be making the big basins like Imbrium or, or Serenitatis, it might be from here. Okay. And so let's think about that for a second. So this is the asteroid belt as we know it today. This is semi axis, this is eccentricity, this is inclination. Here's Mars, and all these little off guys are in the asteroid belt as we know it. Okay. And the asteroid belt ends because there's a resonance here. This is a new secular resonance. You saw it earlier in the talk, it sweeps across the asteroid belt and stops and where it stops, it marks the end of the asteroid belt. Okay? And we also are limited a little bit because things can't survive on Mars crossing orbits. So if they get into Mars crossing orbits, they go away. So Mars is an important part of the story here. Now there's a little population you can barely see here in green, but the green square. These are called the Hungarians. So these are these guys that have all these exotic compositions, but there aren't very many of them. Okay? They're located here in eccentricity space, they're located here in inclination space. This is kind of a special region dynamically where it's between a whole bunch of resonances, and so things can actually stay here for a very, very long time. So it's nice to have that population. There's not a lot of stuff there. Okay? But we're making an assumption. And the assumption we're making is that the way the asteroid belt looks today is the way it's always looked. And we're mostly assuming that because it's the natural thing to assume. But if this resonance were gone, if the giant planets were in different places, it's not clear the asteroid belt would have ended there. So we decided to try an experiment. Let's actually assume that resonance wasn't there. And let's put all the giant planets where they are in the Nice model configuration. Is it possible the asteroid belt would just keep going? So that's what we decided to, to model. So you can see we, put, we basically filled in this region down to the Mars crossing boundary with asteroids. Okay? And we did it over here. And we wanted to see uh, what happens to that population. So I'm calling this the E-belt. It's E-belt because it may have a lot of E-type asteroids there. 
It's a population which I think is now extinct. Um, you can be alone. So there's all sorts of things that can happen. But ultimately, I would argue that the e-belt compositions were very similar to the Hungarians, and I'll show why in a second. Okay? But these things would be very similar to objects that form probably in the terrestrial planet region. So our first thought <coughs> is that if we model this, is this population stable uh, during in the pre meese model configuration? And then what happens to it during the Mies model? So I'm going to actually show both of these in a movie. So these are the terrestrial planets. Here are the Hungarians where they here are where the Hungaria should be. Here's all our objects. Here's where the main belt is. And what I'm going to do is show a movie which is in two parts. It shows a movie of the first 600 million years where everything's sort of evolving away, and then the planets move to their current configurations and everything goes crazy. Okay. So you'll see it go here. So you see for the first few hundred billion years, you lose some particles, but not a lot. And then the plant giant plants move to where they are today, and the whole population just self-destructs, just goes away. Okay. But you'll notice that it drives a lot of material up into the Hungarians. So the Hungarians, this is actually a way to make Hungarians. And it could be that our Hungarians are the last remnant of this original population of this extension of the asteroid belt. That seems to be the most likely scenario. Okay. So this goes away, and over time scales, though, which are pretty long, over hundreds of millions of years or longer, this population. Okay. It turns out that about 7% of all the stuff here ends up hitting uh, the Earth. And that's many times higher than any other population of asteroids we have in the asteroid belt, by about a factor of three to five or so. And so this population doesn't need a lot of stuff to have a lot of impactors hit the Earth, and for that reason, a lot of impactors can hit the Moon. So there's a lot of things to like about this. Okay, so this is what you get. So if you plot up what from that population should end up hitting the Earth and hit the Moon, and you scale the whole of the way we think it should be scaled, it actually does a very nice job of creating our Hungarian asteroids. But what it also does is that if the late of bombardment can be assumed to go from about 4.1 to 3.7, which is about the time we think we're in town. So it's about 400 million year stretch here. So that's where this little red, red box is. We predict that the moon should make on the order of about seven or eight basins. Okay. So if we get seven or eight basins from the E-belt and another three from the asteroid belt, we actually have about 10 to 12 basins or so. And so that actually explains most of our younger basins. So that's actually okay. We're actually pretty happy with that. Okay. But if you're dealing with the Earth here, the Earth actually would make about 100, about 100 basins would form on the Earth at the same time. So if you look at the moon and you look at the night sky and you see big craters like Imbrium and the rest, imagine many, many of those projectiles capable of making that on the moon and hitting the Earth during this time period. So it was a very exciting time to be on the Earth, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Okay. So this is what we predict. So we would say that some of these really old basins are probably from late accretion at some level. These very young basins, maybe the last third or so, are probably, I would say, mostly from the asteroid belt and the E belt. But then there's some room in the middle for different things. Maybe some comets are in here, or maybe it's just a little bit of an excess population from either side. I can't really say at the moment, but I would say, I would say with some reason, about the last third are probably from this new population I'm talking about. So this is all fun, and I try to make a case for this. But is it right? Is there any other way to constrain it? And so this is the, the just a couple things I just found literally in the last week, which is why I want to throw this in this talk. Okay. So what we did is we wanted to say, well, Basins stop on the moon about 3.7, but big craters go on and on. And so rather than just deal with basins, let's start thinking about uh, craters that are maybe on the order of about 150 kilometers, maybe 300 kilometers or so. So I'm going to roughly call these KT sized craters. These are the kind of craters similar to the kinds of things that would have made the Chicxulub crater and the dinosaur killing and all the rest on the Earth. Okay? So if you look at that, what we find on the moon is that about uh, that three of these craters were made on the moon over the entire moon between about 3.7 and 3.2 billion years ago. And our model predicts two. So two and three is almost the same, so that's pretty good. Over here, are, but there's one big impact that's KT sized between about 3.2 and 1 billion years, and our model predicts one. So the fallout here is actually pretty good, which is nice. Okay. But there's not a lot of data here talking about three craters, one crater, not so much. right? So what do you do? Well, it turns out there is an additional set of constraints we can use, but no one's used it so far. And that has to come from impact spherules. Okay. So when you have a big asteroid that hits the Earth, it has to be a really big asteroid. What happens is it vaporizes material, and it sends a lot of the material flying up into space, and it cools when it goes above the Earth's atmosphere. So these are little melt droplets. Okay. So they cool, and then they fall back. And what they do is they produce these global beds of spherules. And we actually see these spheral beds associated with our KT impact and with evidence for other really big impacts on the Earth. If you go back to the very, very early time on the Earth, back to the RT in 3.47, you'll find tons of these little spherules. Okay, so there's a suggestion that some very big impacts were happening at different times on the Earth 
from these spiral beds. The craters are long gone. We don't really have the geology to find the craters, but the spiral beds are there because it's a global distribution. Okay? So if this is right, we can use that to see if it fits with our model. So there's been lots of work done on spiral beds. Uh, Bruce Simonson, Frank Kite, uh, Moen Byerly, and others. And what we get is this. Okay? If we look at the range where they find these late Archean, or the Archean spiral beds from 3.47 to 3.23, so far they've found about seven spiral beds, which probably had to come from objects which are at least the size capable of making the, the Chicxulub crater or so. They find seven beds, and our model predicts about nine, which is pretty nice. If we go a little bit later in time, where more spiral beds have been found, because we have rocks there, the model predicts about three spiral beds, the observations are just about three, between about 2.63 and 2.5. We go a little bit later in time. Here we have one spiral bed, but we have two craters. We have the Freighter Fork Crater and the Sudbury Crater, both which are roughly KT size or larger or so. Our model predicts about two should be there, and we have two observations, which is kind of nice, and one spiral bed, so it all kind of works together. And then finally, after that, when this population finally runs out of gas, there's not much there, uh, we predict there would be almost no big impacts during this time. Our, we predict no big impacts, and the model has maybe one. So zero and one are almost the same thing. So not only for the moon do we fit pretty well with this long tail, we actually do a pretty good job of fitting the Earth as well, which is exciting. So what does this mean? So there's two big implications for this. Okay? First of all, on the moon, in terms of the late bombardment, in, in, in the inner solar system, we probably have a component from late accretion and then maybe even a lull at some point, and then a big spike up, and then a long tail of impacts that happen on Venus and Earth and Mars and all the rest. Okay? So there seems to be really, we need two components. So the original thing I talked about, which is when these two camps were fighting each other, you know, whether it's declining bombardment, whether it's terminal cataclysm, I suspect both must be, both must be right at some level. Okay? So it's kind of nice, everybody wins. Right? This is the way it should be. Okay? And in terms of the Earth, we would predict this is right that there should be about 15 basins that form in the European Earth. So that's a time from about 2.5 to 3.7 billion years ago. So, and these basins don't have to be tiny. These embryos might have, these basins might have been the size of Imbrium and Oriental over that time. And so I think that probably has some big influence on what was going on in the Earth during that time. Okay. Um, also, we're just dealing with KT events. It's not just 15 basins, but you add another 30 more KT events during this time interval. So there's lots of big events happening very late on the Earth. And what's interesting, I'll just point out some coincidences, okay? That just about the time the basins run out, okay, and the big events run out, that's just about the time a lot of interesting things are happening on the Earth. The Earth goes through a big increase in oxygen in about 2.5 billion years. That just happens to be about the time when the basins are done, okay? Major continent building happens on the Earth about 2.7 to 2.5, probably its biggest continent building episode. That just about happens when the basins end, okay? The oceans that we have, between about 1.8 and 0.8, enter in this extremely stable state where they have, uh, they're anoxic, they have lots of H2S, and that lasts for a billion years. That long, long state corresponds to a time, the first time in Earth's history, where it hasn't been getting hit by big impacts for a long period of time. Okay? So I don't know if there's, these are just coincidences, they could easily be, but I'm somehow suspicious there's some kind of weird connection between when the Earth was getting hit by all these big basins and some of these interesting things that are happening from an astrobiology perspective. So something to think about. So I'll just stop there. And, uh, I think if this is right, I think that the reason we want to go to the moon is that lunar samples from the right places can really tell us a lot about the end of planet formation and really tell us about all the worlds of our inner solar system, not just uh, the moon. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. The term exam next week with multiple choice. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's another class in here that we much apologize for. But knowing that there are probably hundreds of questions, we've actually set aside a two-hour slot for questions this afternoon. From 3 to 5 p.m. over in the Grand Club side room, we invite you to come over. Um, I'm not really sure if there are people standing outside or not. I thought there was a class in here. I thought there was, but maybe there wasn't. Maybe there wasn't. Well, if there's nobody actually pounding to come in, maybe we can take a couple of very quick questions. And I'm sorry that was a data dump. I, it's an experiment to try see if I can fit all this into one talk. <laughs> I don't know if it worked or not. If, if you don't think, if it was too much, let me know, because in the future I'm going to probably give this talk again, and I'll cut it down if I think it's too much information. So let's do your, your, your testament. Or help augment. Or I'll, I'll add more. I'll add more stuff. All right, so this is going to be clamoring if there are any really, maybe one or two very good questions. Questions. There's just so much that we just can't process. Well, hey, I guess the question I would have is, uh, what evidence do we have now from current 
earth geology for large impact basins other than submarine and not much. The, the main evidence, we have, when you go back in the Archean, there's almost no, the geologic record we have of the Archean is really, really limited. And, and you know, we just don't have, we just don't have a lot in that time. So uh, the only thing you can say about the impacts from that time comes from these spheral beds that people are finding. And again, they, we only have geologic outcrops of certain regions, and so, or at certain times, so you can really only say what's happening in these very narrow regions. And so I think that's about the only evidence we have are these spheral beds. Beyond that, I think the first evidence for an impact structure we have on the Earth is, is Stratoport, which is about a little bit over 2 billion years old. And then Sudbury, which is 1.85. And I, I've heard there's big debates about whether Sudbury or Freightport is bigger. And, you know, Canadians want Sudbury to be bigger. <laughs> South Africans want Freightport to be bigger. So we'll see, we'll see who wins. Wait a second. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Yeah. What, have you run your uh, models forward as well? Does it show that the solar system is stable in its current configuration? Or are there future episodes coming of asteroid ejections and mass and so on? Well, there's a couple uh, issues here. Um, people have run the solar system ahead in time. That's, it actually takes some very special integrators to do that, which, which account for general relativity and all the rest. And um, for the most part, they find our, stable, our system is probably stable for the next 10 billion years. Um, beyond that, it, it's hard to say. These are very hard things to do. This is done by Jacques Lascar in France or so. Um, but also the thing to keep in mind is that it's possible, and you see this exosolar, exosolar planetary system, it's possible that planet formation sets up an unstable state. And the system doesn't know it's unstable, you know, it just kind of finds its state it's in. And, but essentially you're on the edge of a precipice. And, when the, and when things go, everything goes, and you're left in this state where most of the mass and everything else is gone, so it's harder to move into another state <coughs> beyond that. So it could be that you have catastrophic episodes where things all get changed around, but it probably doesn't happen all, more than a few, I mean, more than once or twice, I would say. Okay, so I'm going to invite other people who have questions. Please come over to the Rad Club at the tree, and let's thank our speaker one more time.